Sweet because you know we're 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 ending what really is arguably the greatest five chapters in all of the Bible. Uh, of course, I'm speaking uh, about the teachings of Jesus to his disciples uh, during the hours leading up to his arrest and, and crucifixion. You know what what began back in chapter 13 at the supper table. Uh, is now ending in chapter 17, uh, either in the Garden of Gethsemane or just on the outside of the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll recall back in chapter 13, they they ended supper. Uh, it was the scene where uh, uh, Jesus begins to wash the disciples' feet. After he washes the disciples' feet, we know that Judas, the devil, had entered into Judas, and, and Judas left to go do what he was uh, going to do, and Jesus began this teaching in verse 13 that continued, uh, excuse me, in chapter 13 that continued uh, in 14, continued in 15, continued in 16, and, and we're ending really uh, uh, this morning in chapter 17 with Jesus praying. All of chapter 17 is a prayer that Jesus makes to the Father for himself for the disciples, and for you and I. And I remember sharing with you guys when we began these five chapters that I was a little intimidated to preach uh, from these chapters because all of the words, almost all of them, with the exception of a couple of stops of questions, are in red, which of course means in your Bible, any words spoken in red uh, are directly out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. And we know that the scriptures in and of themselves are God-breathed. They are given by inspiration from God. So every word technically is from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why John 1.1 1, 1 starts that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so we know that the scriptures from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 could technically be written in red, but what sets the words in red in the Gospels apart from the rest of the scripture is that these words were spoken solely during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. You'll also notice that in the book of Revelation, there are some words spoken in red as well. That is because Jesus is communicating directly with John, who of course is the writer of the gospel according to St. John as well. But there's just something about preaching the words in red that has driven me to study and to know and to meditate on the scriptures more carefully. It's not that I have neglected any other preparation of any other time that I have preached, but of all the verses and of all the chapters in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I tend to dig my heels in a little bit more uh, and a little bit tighter when it comes to the Gospels. You know, from Genesis to Malachi, that's the Old Testament. Genesis to Malachi is all the Old Testament, and it prepares us, those chapters in the Old Testament, they prepare us for what's coming in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so when you finally get there, you sort of have this moment where you say to yourself, this is what I've been waiting for. If you were to read the Bible from cover to cover and, and not really have a plan, so to speak, like a chronological plan or any other sort of plan of the Bible, if you were to read from Genesis to Malachi, 
by the time you get to the New Testament in the book of Matthew, you get to this position where, wow, this is what I've been waiting for. Why? Because Genesis through Malachi prepares you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the coming Messiah. It's all about the salvation of the world and the saving, of course, of Israel through their Messiah, the Christ Jesus, whom we know is our personal Lord and Savior. And, and so I, I, I tend to find myself attuned to what Jesus has got to say when he's finally here on earth. Because the Bible is preparing us through the Old Testament for his arrival here on earth. And so he gets here and you're like, okay, now that he's here, what is he going to speak to us? What's he going to say to us, right? And so this morning, church families, we finish this portion of the gospel according to St. John. I, I want us to pay very close attention to a few things. How Jesus prays what Jesus prays, and for who Jesus prays. And so with that being said, if you haven't already, if you got your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 17. I'm going to read the first eight verses, and then we're going to get going this morning in our, uh, in our text. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. It says this, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Church family, bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we dive into the 17th chapter in the gospel according to St. John, Lord, as we really look at the final words spoken by Jesus uh, during his earthly ministry before he is taken in the garden, before he is brought before Herod and, and Pilate, Lord, for what is really a kangaroo court and a mock trial, and Lord God, before he's led away to the cross, and crucified for the sins of the world. Lord, I thank you for these final words that Jesus spoke. And Lord, that they are in the form of a prayer. I pray, Lord God, this morning that as we look at the prayer of Jesus, that Lord God, it would have an impact on our prayer. Looking at how Jesus prayed, looking at uh, to what he prayed for, and looking to whom he prayed for. Lord God, I, I ask that you would move me aside this morning. Uh, Father God, that your words would become my words, Lord, that your thoughts would become my thoughts as I speak your word this morning and meditate on it and share it with the church family. May it be a blessing to those listening right now, to those sitting before me, to those that will hear it later, Father God. And Lord, may you just have a profound impact on the service this morning. Father, I ask and I pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Point number one, we're going to look at verses one through eight, is a prayer to the Father. You know, Jesus starts, of course, this uh, chapter by really saying, Father, the hour is come. He says, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Jesus knew that the final hours of his life lay ahead. He, We know Biblically speaking, that right after this, Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. He does pray to the Father again, which which uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at next week. But 
really he's he's arrested by the, 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 by the Roman soldiers. He's taken before Herod. He's taken before Pilate. He has the trial. They find him guilty of Pilate. You know, even though Pilate washed his hands of the situation, and even though Pilate said, I find no fault in him, the Jews still demanded that he be crucified. And so Jesus was crucified. Jesus knew that that hour is now here. He knew that that is what laid ahead. He knew that the agony that uh, that was going to be laid ahead for him, he knew the suffering that was going to be laid ahead for him, he knew what was going to happen. And he says, Father, the hour has come. And what does he say? He says, glorify thy son. Jesus says, Father, glorify thy son. It was through the humiliation of the cross that brought the return of the glory of Jesus Christ to himself. But there was a reason why Jesus said, Father, glorify thy son. There was a reason behind it, and that reason is given to us in the first verse. It says, so that thy son also may glorify you. He says, Father, glorify me that I may glorify you. All throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, his sole purpose was to glorify the Father. He didn't do it for himself. He was not in it for himself. His sole purpose, and you can read it all throughout the Gospels, was to glorify the Father. And so when he prays and he asks God to glorify him, he says, I want you to glorify me so that I may glorify you. That in receiving of my glory, I am going to use it to glorify you. Jesus' obedience to the cross and the nailing of our sins to it glorified the Father through that obedience and the exhibited love of God. Remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If Jesus didn't go to the cross the Father would not have been glorified through the work of the cross, nor would the world have known the love of the Father who sacrificed his Son for our sins. And so when Jesus says, Father, glorify me, that I may glorify you, it's so that the accomplished work of the cross through the obedience of Jesus Christ could glorify God because of his love for you and for me. He says in verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Jesus Christ has been given power and authority over all flesh, over all creation, so that whosoever would believe in him, this verse says, would be given eternal life. Jesus Christ has the power given to him by God the Father to give you and I eternal life. That's why all is focused on Jesus. That's why Jesus is solely the way, the truth, and the life that we read about in John 14 and 6, and that no man can come to the Father but through him. Why? Because all authority and all power has been given to Jesus Christ. There's no other way to get to God but through the Father. Excuse me, but through Jesus Christ. He says, and this is life eternal. He gives us the the definition of eternal life. In verse 3, that they might know thee, the only true God. And then here's a key word in verse 3. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is contingent upon you and I knowing the one true living God and his son, Jesus Christ. Eternal life does not come to those who only know the one true living God. I would argue, what God is that to you? Many people today, when you ask them, oh, I believe in God. Okay, great. What God? Who's your God? Do you know his son? Because that's the key right there. No, to know the one true living God and Jesus Christ, that is the key to eternal life. 
Lots of people know God. Lots of people think that they're good enough to get God's mercy, to get God's favor, to get God's grace, to get themselves into heaven. The fact is, you can never be good enough. The scriptures are very clear. There is none good, no, not one. Our goodness and our glory and our righteousness and our holiness come solely through Jesus Christ. That's why it's so imperative when you read the scriptures that you look at little key words like this and because it is contingent upon what we believe and our faith and ultimately where we're going to be spending eternity. Yeah, you can know God, but I'm telling you, if you don't know his son, Jesus Christ, eternity is at stake for you. Where you spend all of eternity is going to be dependent upon what you believe and who you believe. Do you believe in God and his son, Jesus Christ? That's what Jesus says is life eternal. He says in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work, he says, that you gavest me to do. You know, John 4 and 34 says, "My Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of the Father that sent me and to finish the work. Jesus knew his purpose. He knew the job that he was given. He knew what he was supposed to do. And by the time we get to this verse, verse number four in chapter 17, he says, Father, I have finished the work which you've given me to do. I've shared the gospel. I've glorified you. I've honored you. All the words that you've given me to speak, I've spoken them to you. And because Jesus knew that he was going to the cross, which is the ultimate final work, he can say aforetime, I finished the work because I know what I'm about to go do. I know I'm going to go to the cross. I know I'm not going to... I'm not going to reject the cross. Jesus didn't turn around on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane and say, you know what, I'm not doing it. He didn't admit that he was a blasphemer. He didn't give in to the Jews. He told Pilate the truth. He didn't refrain from going to the cross. He knew that the work was going to be finished. And he says, Father, I finished the work which thou hast given me to do. I pray one day when we all get to heaven, that we can look God in the eyes and say, Father, I've finished the work that you've given me to do. I've finished the message that you gave me to send. I've accomplished the task that you've put in my life. I've ran the race, Lord, and I've ran it well. I looked after the flock that you've given me. I cared for those that you put into my life. I bared the burdens and so fulfilled the law of Christ. I pray one day we can do that. I pray now that that is our heart's desire to focus on that. Jesus then says in verse number five, and I got to tell you, I was parked on this verse for a while. He says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I paused there for a while and I asked myself, did Jesus have to give up his glory to come down to earth and to dwell amongst man? And I was parked there for a while and I, I remember making a phone call. I, I called a buddy of mine and I asked that same question. And, I, and it stumped him too. But the more and more I read it, the more and more I, I, I looked at other scriptures, I was drawn to Philippians chapter 2, and we just went over this a few weeks back, folks. Philippians chapter 2 says this, beginning of verse 5. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, this is it, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant 
and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, or because of that, because Jesus made himself obedient unto death, the Bible says, wherefore, or because of that, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ had to remove himself from his glory which he had with God the Father in heaven from the beginning. And whenever the beginning was, God is eternal and God is everlasting. There was no beginning with God. But Jesus Christ left his glory. He came down to earth as a humbled servant to take on the form of man and went to the cross as a man, and he bled like a man, and he wept like a man, and he sweat like a man, and he had pain like a man. He left his glory to dwell amongst you and I for the sole purpose of going to the cross. That's why he asks the Father in verse 1, Father, glorify me. Well, one would presume, well, isn't Jesus already glorified? Well, when he was a man here on earth, he had left his glory to dwell here on earth. Now, Matthew, excuse me, uh, uh, Peter, James, and John in Matthew chapter 17, you'll recall, had a glimpse of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw the glory of Jesus Christ with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw him for who he really is, the glorious king of kings and lord of lords. They got to see a glimpse of it. But that went away, and then he went about and carried about his business, dwelling here on earth as a man. But he says, Father, glorify me with the same glory of thy own self, which I had with thee before the world was. This puts away any rumors or any false doctrine that Jesus Christ is not eternal. He says, which I had with thee before the world was. There are many religions out there that, that, that associate themselves with Christianity that will tell you that Jesus is not eternal. That Jesus is of course, he's born of God, but that Satan is his brother, that Jesus is a created being. There's religions out there preaching that message, that Jesus is a created being. This puts away anything, any rumor of that nonsense and of that heresy preached from the Gospels. Jesus always was and always was with God the Father and was glorified alongside God the Father. He says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. He says, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. You know, it's, it's interesting because as you read the Gospels, there's many a times where the disciples wavered in their faith. There's many times where a guy like Peter put his foot in his mouth and spoke way too soon before he should have spoken. There's many times where they, they lacked faith. Jesus would even confront them, O oh, ye of little faith. Jesus would rebuke Peter, get thou behind me, Satan. But Jesus here acknowledges in his prayer to God the Father that they have kept the word of God. It, it was almost a recognition or an acknowledgement of how well the disciples are doing. Now, we would know that coming up, they would all scatter and they would lose faith and they would lose doubt. But Jesus acknowledged that they have kept thy word. It's so important to keep the word of God in our hearts. It's so important to bring into remembrance the word of God because although in just a couple of short hours, all the disciples would scatter, 
all of them would flee, all of them would go away, they would, they would run away in fear after the arrest of Jesus Christ, it is because they knew and kept the word of God in their hearts that just three days later, when Jesus is resurrected, all the things that they were taught and all the things that they were shown and all the things that were spoken to them through the Gospels, they remembered and they kept in their hearts. The Word of God is literally the only hope that you and I have in moments of, of, of trials, in moments of tribulation, in moments of dis distress. It is the hope of the Word of God. It is being brought into remembrance of the living hope that we have in this Word and of the promises of God. That is why it's so important to keep the Word of God. David says, Lord, hide thine Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's so important that we hide the word of God, that we keep the word of God, that we are acknowledged for having kept the word of God. Then he says in verses seven and eight, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. You know, these are really just examples of faithful living through the word of God. Jesus says again, they have known all the things that thou hast given me. Faithful living. That's why it's so important to study the word that we may know all the things that God the Father gave to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I've given them the words that you gave me. I've shared with them what you wanted me to share. And he says, now I know surely, or they know that I have come from you. And they have believed that thou didst send me. You don't know this unless you live by faith. You don't know this unless you genuinely study the scriptures and believe everything that is being said out of them. So many people reject Jesus Christ because they don't believe that he came from God. They, they, they cannot wrap their heads around the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they utterly deny it. And so denying God the Father who sent Jesus Christ. That's why he says, the disciples have known that I've come from you, and they have believed that thou sent me. That is an imperative to our faith. That is part of the gospel story that God sent his son. Part of the gospel story is us believing that he did so, is us trusting that he did so. Point number two, we see a shift in his prayer. It's a prayer for the disciples. He says, I pray for them in verse nine. For them, who? The disciples. He says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Jesus does not pray for the world. The world is not his. The world right now, as we live in it, has been given to Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. Satan has been given dominion and authority over this world. Jesus does not pray for this world. The world and the kingdom of God are enemies of one another. Jesus does not pray for this world. But he says... I pray for those which you have given me, for they are thine. One key component in our prayer life is praying for those that we know have been given to God the Father through Jesus Christ. That is our immediate circle. Of course, our spouse, our children, our church family, other friends, other family. Jesus says that I prayed for them. Why? Because they are there. They are yours, Father. We want Jesus praying for you and I. We need Jesus praying 
for you and I. He says in verse 10, all and all mine are thine and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. Folks, pay very close attention to this. Jesus Christ is glorified through his disciples' keeping of the word. We were created to glorify God. We do so through the keeping of the word of God. You want to focus on how you can glorify God? Father, show me how I can glorify you. Keep his word. Obey his word. Maintain all the precepts. Maintain all the statutes that are in this word. Apply this word to your own life, to your own heart, to your own mind. That's how you glorify God. Through the keeping of his word. He says in verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, speaking of the disciples. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Jesus begins to interject the importance of making sure that we are of one accord with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. He says, I'm coming, I'm coming to you, Dad. I'm going away. I'm not going to be here anymore. But those that I'm leaving behind, those that are going to be staying here on earth, he says, Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that, may, that we may be of one as you and I are of one. Jesus prayed to God the Father that you and I would be of one accord with Jesus Christ and with his, only, and with his heavenly Father. Jesus prayed that we would all be of one accord, of one mind. That was his desire, that there would be no separation, that there would be no uh, disillusion, that there would be no uh, 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 dissidence, if you will, between the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father and amongst ourselves. He says in verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus says it here in verse 12, I have kept everybody that you've given me. Everyone that you've given me, I have kept. They're mine. And they're because they were yours. They're mine. He says, but one. We know who that one is. The son of perdition is Judas. Judas the betrayer. Judas Iscariot. He says in Psalm, uh, he says that, that scripture might be fulfilled. Well, Psalm 41 and 9 says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. A prophecy was fulfilled when Judas betrayed Jesus Christ, lifting up his heel against him, of whom he ate bread with. Remember, Jesus broke bread with Judas. That same night that he was betrayed, he, he had dinner with Jesus. He broke bread with Jesus. Jesus washed Judas' feet. But Judas would go on to betray him, thus fulfilling the scripture that Jesus spoke about in verse number 12. He says in 13, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus, knowing that he's going to the Father, leaving behind all the words that he spoke here in the world, has given us a reason to be fulfilled with joy. The words Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry were for the fulfillment of joy in our lives. Every word that Jesus spoke is for the fulfillment of joy in our lives. That's why it's so important going back to knowing this word, to understanding it because it fills our joy. You guys have heard me say it before, Psalm 1611. 
In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of our joy through the words which he spoke to you and I. Anytime I can encourage somebody, I don't encourage them with my own words. I encourage them with what the word of God says. I got nothing on the word of God. Don't find joy in what I'm telling you. Find joy in what the word of God is telling you. That's why Jesus spoke them. That's why Jesus gave them to you and I. That's why he spoke in this world. That our joy may be fulfilled through what it is that he told us. He says in verse 14, I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We hit on this idea last week. The world hates you and I. We are at war with this world. Why? Because we are spirit filled. The spirit warreth against the flesh, and the flesh warreth against the spirit. This world has nothing for you and I to offer. And sadly, we have nothing the world wants. That's why it hates us. It hates us because it doesn't understand us. And sadly, people's minds are so warped and so twisted that if they don't understand something, they assume that they have to hate it. They assume that they can't like it. Jesus says this world hates you. Why? Because I've given them my word. It hates you because we are not of this world. It hates you because Jesus is not of this world. You can't make Jesus conform to the ways of this world. You can't create or shape or mold Jesus to fit the world's ideas and the world's standards and the world's ideologies, yet that is what's taking place everywhere today. People are creating fake Jesuses to fulfill their own agendas. Fake Jesuses that are going to conform to their own lifestyles and their own desires. They can't have that. Jesus won't allow it. He's not of this world. So you can't bring Jesus down into a world that he's not a part of. Nor are you and I a part of it. Thus, we should not conform to it. We should not bend. We should not form. We should not give in to the ways of this world to meet the needs of others. We're not of this world, folks. The Bible's very clear. Peter talks about this. We're pilgrims, man. We're just passing through. We're just going through life knowing that our eternal home is not here. We have dual citizenship right now. We have world citizenship and we have a heavenly citizenship. <clears throat> we have to dwell here. We have to live here. We have to honor and glorify God here. But man, my citizenship is up in heaven. I'll rebuke this citizenship here on earth 10 times on Sunday for my citizenship in heaven. We are not of this world, folks. We've got to remember that. It was super cheesy. But there was an NOTW campaign years ago, not of this world. Bumper stickers galore. It was on everything. Every church was preaching it, not of this world. Whoever came up with that bumper sticker slogan campaign, the TV band, they probably made millions of dollars. But folks, we're not of this world. Which means we, we, we can't be like it. We can't conform to it. We've got to live in it, but we've got to live it to the glory of the kingdom of God, where our true citizenship is, what our true identity is in. Our identity isn't in the things of this world. My identity isn't in, you know, my, my, my part-time job. It's not in my hobbies. My identity isn't in the material possessions that I have. 
It, it, it's not on a blog or a podcast that I might do. It's it's it, it's not on the Facebook post that, that 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 I put out there on social media or wherever. That's not my identity. My identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ. My citizenship is in the kingdom of God. There's absolutely zero reason, there's absolutely zero excuse why you can't today, right now, start living with those two things in mind. That your identity is in Christ Jesus and that your citizenship is in the kingdom of God. Hey, and folks, while you're at it, bring people along with you. Let them know who their identity is in. Not this world, not the things that are in it, but in Jesus Christ. He says in verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. Folks, if I had one disagreement, if I had one disagreement in this prayer that Jesus lifted up, it's in this verse right here. He says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Well, why not? Why not, Jesus? Why, why, why don't you want me to be taken out of this world? Look, I actually want you to pray, Lord, that you take me out of this world. But he says, I pray not that you take them out of this world, but that you should keep them from the evil. Now, the literal translation of this, of course, is to be kept from the evil one. Sadly, we know throughout history that many Christians have not been kept from evil. They've been touched by the evil hand of others or the evil doings of others or the evil sayings of others or, 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 or other wickedness and evil that has had an effect on Christian lives over time. But that thou shouldest keep us from the evil one. Keep Satan at bay. Keep the devil at bay. Keep his minions at bay. Protect us from Satan. Protect us from the wiles of the devil. Lord, if you're gonna, if you're gonna insist and pray that I be not taken out of this world, the least you can do is make sure I'm protected from it. The least you can do is make sure I'm protected from the one that's running this world right now. It may not be the prayer that I would agree with. Lord, I, I pray not that you take them out of the world. Lord, would you pray that you take me out of the world? But I'll take the prayer that, that Jesus offers up to keep me from the evil. To keep you from the evil. He says in verse 16 again, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he says in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, in, 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 in pointing out in the previous verses that we are not of this world, Jesus asked the Father to set us apart from it. That word sanctify means to make holy. It means to make set apart or, or to distance oneself from. When Jesus prayed to the Father to sanctify us or to set us apart from this world, to make us holy through thy truth, he was praying to the Father for us to be separated from this world, to be different. And that difference comes through the word of God. It is the word of God that sanctifies you and I. He says again, sanctify them through thy truth or set them apart through thy truth. He says thy word is truth. One cannot be sanctified apart from the word of God. The word of God is truth and the word of God is what sets you and I apart from the rest of the world. The rest of the world does not believe this word. It does not understand this word. It does not want anything to do with this word. Thus, we are sanctified. We are set apart from the world because of this word. This is what separates us. The scriptures is what makes us holy when we maintain them. He says in verse 18, and thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. 
That there's this idea that the disciples are picking up where Jesus left off. He says, even as you have sent me into the world, I send them into the world. Jesus came down to share the gospel message. Jesus came down to preach the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came to glorify the Father through the work of the Son. Jesus says, now I'm sending the disciples to pick that up. That's why Jesus would say in Luke, to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Pick up the work. Pick up the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pick up the glorifying of the Father through the message of the cross. Continue the work. The work never ends, folks. The work of the cross, the power of the cross, the salvation of the cross does not end until the great and terrible day of the Lord. Even during the tribulation, there's opportunity for people to be saved, to turn their hearts to Jesus Christ. It's going to be a little bit grimmer in those days for them than for you and I. But the mercy of God is going to be extended even through some of the greatest tragedies that this world is ever going to know during the tribulation time period. But he said, but Jesus says, Father, I'm sending them the same way you sent me to glorify you and to honor you. It's the great commission, folks. It's the job that each believer has been given in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Jesus says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In other words, Jesus is telling you and I, be set apart because I am set apart. That's what he's saying here. I've sanctified myself. I've set myself apart from this world so that we, the disciples, might be sanctified and set apart through the truth, which is the word of God. Jesus gave us the example of what we ought to do. He set the foundation for godly living for Christ-like living. He showed us what needs to take place. He showed us that we need to be sanctified. He showed us that we need to be set apart. He showed us that we need to pick up our cross daily and follow him. He showed us that we need to continue the great commission, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He showed us how to glorify the Father. Jesus showed us all that we need to do. Now that he's up in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He's given us the instruction. He's given us the blueprints. And then we get to verse 20, point number three. We see that Jesus has prayed for the disciples. Now Jesus is going to pray for those to come. He says, Neither pray I for these alone, speaking of the disciples, but for them, you and I, also which shall believe on me through their word. If you go back and you look at the fact that Jesus says in verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world to carry out the glorifying of God the Father. Without that, folks, without that, verse 20 is futile. Without that, the prayer of Jesus in verse 20 is meaningless. If the disciples did not go out, if they did not do the Great Commission, if they weren't obedient to the calling of every disciple to preach the word of God, then verse 20 is pointless in being there. But Jesus, knowing that the Great Commission would go out, that the church would, would, would leap forth and spring forth, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus prays this for you and I. He says, I pray for those which shall believe on me through their word. Well, who's there? 
through the disciples' word that they're going to start spreading when the church starts to go crazy. Through the word of Matthew. Through the word of Peter. Through the word of James. Through the word of Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy. Through the word of Jude. Through all these words of saints that have come before us, the gospel message has been carried forth for thousands of years and people have come to faith and come to knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is who Jesus is praying for right here. For you and I, who are part of that gospel message story that has been spread forth because Jesus sent those into the world the same way the Father sent him into the world. He says in verse 21 that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know, the unity of the Godhead should translate to our unity with the Godhead. Let me say that again. The unity of the Godhead, the unity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit should translate to our unity with the Godhead, with God the Father, with God the Son, with God the Holy Spirit. Jesus' desire for you and I is to be as one. Not only with him, but as I previously mentioned, with one another. As Paul says, with one another. We should not only be one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we must be one with each other as the body of Christ and as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm telling you, if we are not as one, the world will assume that the Godhead is not one. If there is dissension in the church, if there's a separation of the body of Christ and of the body of believers, the world is just going to assume that there's dissension from the throne of God and dissension amongst the rest of the body of believers that claim he is who he is. Jesus prayed that we are one with him that we are one with the Father, that we are one with with each other. It's so imperative to the furtherance of the gospel message as we've been given direction to give that we do it as one accord, that we share it as one, that the message is the same through and through. There's no changing of the gospel. There's no altering of the gospel. It has to be as one, even as the Father and the Son are one, Jesus desires that we are one with him and with one another. He says in verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me me. You know, this this verse really in verse 23 is an example of the unity of marriage. The two becoming one. The two becoming one. It's an illustration of our unity with Jesus Christ. I die to myself. I die daily that Christ may live and may reign and may rule in me. It's no longer Solomon. It's Jesus. I'm unified with, with, with the Son. I'm unified with the Savior. Similarly to how a husband and wife would be unified with one another. And as Christ is unified with the Father. He says in verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, 
for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Jesus prays, I will. Listen to the will of Jesus in this verse. I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. It is the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ for you and I to be with him. That's his desire. He wants you and I with him. He prayed the Father, I will that they be with me where I am. And one day we know that that will come true for each and every one of us that have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That will come true. The prayer of Jesus right here will come true one day for all of us. Jesus' will is for you and I to be united with him and God the Father will answer this prayer. It's a promise. It's what we have our living hope in through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that one day where Christ is, you and I will be there with him as well that we may behold his glory. In the same way that Peter, James, and John got a glimpse of it, folks, for just a moment, we will behold with our own eyes the glory of Jesus Christ. A glory so bright, a radiance so brilliant that the scriptures say there will be no sun, S-U-N, because the Son of God and His glory and His radiance will be bright enough to, br to light the entire world for all eternity. We get to behold that one day with our own eyes. The will of Jesus Christ, the prayer of Jesus Christ will be answered. One day when you and I get to behold his glory because we are with him where he is. He is going to bring us into eternal presence with God the Father. He says in verse 25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. He says in verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. The whole purpose, the whole purpose in Christ declaring God's word to the disciples and to you and I was in order that God's love might be in you and I and Christ in you and I as well. The whole purpose of the work of Jesus Christ, of Christ declaring God's word, of finishing the work that Jesus said in verse one that he is finished. The whole purpose behind it was so that we would know the love of God, that the love of God might be in you and I and that his son would eternally be dwelling in our hearts and in our lives forever. That is the purpose behind this word right here. That is the purpose behind the words in red. That is the purpose behind the prayer that Jesus has lifted up right here in chapter 17. That the love of God would be in you and I, and that Jesus Christ would be in you and I as well. Church family, we know what comes next. We know that the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ lies ahead. And while we have the full picture that shortly thereafter is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we need to keep in mind the disciples did not. Even though Christ prepared them and alluded to his return, and alluded to his resurrection, it didn't change the moment that Jesus was taken away from them. It serves as a point that even with the heartache that we know is to come, we can rest and find hope 
in the words in red given to us throughout the Gospels and in these last five chapters of John that we've gone through to overcome even the most difficult of circumstances in our lives, knowing, knowing, church family, that soon glory awaits because the rock has been rolled away and the tomb is empty. If you think about it, the gospel message is just getting warmed up, church family, and that's cause for us to be filled with joy today. Amen? Well, pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you once again for your word. Thank you for this gospel message. Thank you for this prayer of Jesus, Lord God. And, and I know you've heard it, Lord God, and I know that you've answered it, Heavenly Father. And I pray that as we continue to meditate on this prayer of Jesus, that, Lord God, you would continue to answer it the way that you have intended it to be answered, Father God. Not only did Jesus pray for the disciples with him at that time, but he also prayed for those of us that through the gospel message given to the disciples and administered by the disciples, that those of us that come to faith and belief in God the Father, in God the Son, and in God the Holy Spirit will find great joy and great comfort. And I pray that we take that away with us today, Lord God, that the message of the cross, that the life of Jesus Christ would fulfill our joy, even in the darkest and most discouraging of circumstances of our life. Lord, thank you for the hope that you've given us through your only begotten Son. Thank you for the accomplished work that you have given us through the cross and through the empty tomb, Father. And may you continue to not only be glorified through your Son, but Lord, glorified through us in how we worship you, in how we praise you, and in how we respond to the gospel message given to us through this book. Lord God, thank you so much for this morning. I ask and pray this all right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.